Welcome to the Champions of Active Women podcast. In this podcast, we will interview individuals who have been successful within athletics and beyond. We hope that these interviews will encourage and inspire girls and women to be active for a lifetime, to reach their goals, and to break new barriers in sport and life. This podcast is brought to you by the Active Women's Health Initiative and the Sports Medicine Research Institute at the University of Kentucky. The mission of the Active Women's Health Initiative is to optimize health and promote physical activity and wellness for girls and women across the lifespan. We hope you enjoy our conversations and join us in understanding women's health today to ensure women's health tomorrow. Dr. Katherine Stone is a licensed psychologist specializing in individual psychotherapy with a private practice in Lexington, Kentucky. She earned her bachelor's degree in psychology and a master's and PhD in school psychology from the University of Kentucky. Dr. Stone has over 20 years of experience as a clinician working with children through young adults. She has expertise in treating anxiety disorders, depression, ADHD, Asperger's, and learning disabilities. She is an active member of the community with a history of serving on advisory boards that support youth in the community, including Girls on the Run, Camp Horse and Around, The Joy Effect, Bluegrass Chad, Girls Rock, and The Explorium. Today, Dr. Stone is joining us via Zoom for a conversation about the integration of mental and physical health, her experiences working to promote mental health in clinical practice and in the community, and her own active lifestyle. So welcome, Dr. Stone. Thank you for joining me today. Uh, it was my pleasure. So I'd like to start with a really broad question today and just thinking about what health means to you. You know, that really is a, a great question. Uh, when I think about health, I think about my physical health and my mental health and just overall balance in life. Um, and so focusing on disease prevention now that I'm 51 as well as being able to um, to stay grounded mentally, just being a, a therapist, it's really important to do self-care. So I guess the simple answer is when I think about health, I think so much about my physical and my mental. So, you know, and I kind of assumed you might say something like that. And so my next question is, you know, thinking about all of the connections that we now know exist between our physical and mental health, um, Many people still see those as separate things, our physical and our mental health. And, and I'm wondering if you could just talk about your perspectives on the integration between physical and mental. Well, we know that there's a ton of research that indicates that individuals that are cardiovascularly fit have better attention and memory, but they also have lower rates of depression and anxiety. Um, there's such a connection between that. We know when you work out and you get your heart rate up, that it increases the blood, blood circulation to your brain. And it also affects serotonin and dopamine and norepinephrine levels um, so that those neurotransmitters are trapped in the spots of the brain that you need it. It also decreases stress hormones like adrenaline and cortisol. So it's crucial. And, and it's especially crucial right now with COVID uh, when individuals are leaving their houses less and they um, are just overall even getting less movement during the day. Yeah, have you seen the impacts of that in, in your practice, either in you know um, just reports from patients or um, the number of patients that you're seeing in, in this COVID time? You know, I've been practicing so long that I don't really take new patients. So, and my, my answering machine says that. So in terms of seeing an uptick in calls, I haven't because I just don't, I guess people call them and I, I just don't take new patients. Um, right. But certainly from the kids that I'm seeing and, um, and the college students and even talking to the parents, there's an increase in depression primarily. I'm not seeing quite as much anxiety, but a lot of depression. But part of my hypothesis is that even kids uh, got movement from walking from the bus line into the building, to the cafeteria, recess. There was just so much more movement that you get in your day when you're leaving your home and you're either going to work, or you're going to school or college campuses. If you think about how much kids walk on college campuses. Mm -hmm. So I don't know that we appreciated how much even that simple movement in life affects mental health. Yeah, and I think it's interesting because we are, um, as a society, we, you know, speaking at large, we we don't move a whole lot, right? There, there's lots of challenges with inactivity, but uh, I think it's interesting that you're saying that even that little bit we were getting that we didn't even realize we were getting might be having an impact. 
I certainly see that. Uh, I would love to see a step counter on some of some of the kids that I work with now. Now, little kids, right? I don't know how old your children are, but little kids are still going to get movement, right? Mm-hmm. Their bodies just yeah, they, they're, they're <laughs> they drawn crave to it. it. Yeah, they do. Um, but when you get into grades like fifth, sixth, and above, um, kids don't get as much as they need to especially high schoolers. Um, And then we have kids are sitting in front of screens and that's such a powerful reinforcer that sometimes they lose that motivation to go out um, and go out and play or move. So what is something that we might be surprised to know about our, our mental or our physical health and that integration between the two? You know, I don't know how many people know that there are a lot of studies that indicate that you can abate depression just with exercise. Um, in our society, we tend to move towards medication fairly quickly, but there's a ton of research that with milder depression, if we can get people moving and exercising on a daily or at least a few times a week basis, that they may not need medication. We certainly know that with uh, all kinds of health issues, like I, my cholesterol is high and I'm holding it bay, uh, holding it at bay and trying to work out more um, and make some nutritional changes so I don't have to take that pill. But I don't know that how many people realize how much good research there is that indicates um, um, how we can lessen it. Yeah, no, enough research that it's now in our physical activity, our newest sets of physical activity guidelines is one of the, the benefits. And, and so that was one of the newer things that came out. That's good. So in your, in your career as a licensed psychologist, you're working with individuals from childhood through young adulthood to improve mental health, um, and you take a really comprehensive approach to treating patients. So I'm wondering if you'd just talk about your philosophy and maybe some of your core principles that guide your practice. You know, I, I really hope I come across as having a positive family uh, focus, which is I think that parents and kids are doing the best that they can. So my job is to take families where they are without judgment and help to teach them the skills to be able to function better. So whether it's parent coaching and helping parents of adolescents or young kids with the behavioral issues or family connectedness, or whether it's the child trying to be a better member of their family. So I take a positive family approach. My theoretical orientation is cognitive behavioral. So we look a lot at how thoughts affect feelings, which then affect behaviors or choices. Um, So um, I guess that would be kind of my summary of the two things that I think kind of guide my day-to-day practice. Yeah. And that that, um, positive family focus really resonates with me right now because I think, you know, Give it, it sounds like you're giving families the benefit of the doubt, right? Just, you know, you know, they're oh, trying absolutely. and, <laughs> and I, you know, I know that I appreciate that right now in, in all aspects of my life because um, it, it has been stressful, right? In this, this COVID time. Um, I think that's an awesome central component of your work. <laughs> what, what led you to this career? You know, I, when I was in college, I knew I wanted to work with kids. I just, that was my calling was to do something with kids. And so that I explored all the options and being a mental health provider felt like that's what I would enjoy the most. Mm -hmm. And so that was initially what that was initially is finding some area to work with children. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I thought I wanted to be a school teacher. And I think that is such a a valuable profession, but I wanted to do more individual work. So I had thought about pediatrics, but to be quite honest, the whole hard science curriculum overwhelmed me. (laughs) Although my my oldest is actually in med school now at UK and will do some type of pediatric specialty is her hope. So um, yeah, I wanted to work with children. And then, and when I was in college, we all did a few sessions with comp care. It was free. It was kind of the thing to do to enter therapy. Mm -hmm. And I remember sitting in my therapist's office, kind of talking about what I wanted to do for a career. And I saw some toys, like some games under her couch. And I asked about that and she said um, that she saw kids and did therapy. And it was that moment I just knew. Yeah. Um, so, and then, and then I followed that path. It's kind of fun. I was at a conference maybe 10 years ago and she was there and I got to, she was at this training and I got to tell her what an impact that had made. <laughs> it's so. so, it's so funny that little moment, you know, it's, it's just something clicked in that moment and, um, you know, led to this, this long career. Yeah. So from your perspective, as you're working with youth, what are some of the biggest challenges that you think our youth are facing in promoting their health? Um, and, and I'm 
staying healthier globally as, as we introduced it at the beginning? You know, I think that it's twofold, but it goes back to what we all talk about is technology. So one is the convenience of technology allows kids to be more sedentary. Back when I was, back when I was growing up, um, <laughs> you didn't stay in the house all day because we had three channels and, and there weren't shows geared towards kids. Like the first Nintendo came out, but that was that awful game. Was it Pong? I, I don't remember what it was, but so there wasn't a ton to do in the house. And if I was bored or whiny, my mom would give us a chore. So there was a huge motivation to be out of the house and to be outside on our bike or out playing with other people. So the convenience of the technology and the amount of reward we get from that is a challenge. Uh, and for adults too, I, I see parents yep. just as addicted to their phones as I see um, kids. And I use the phrase addicted lightly there, but overuse. Right. The other issue, as we talk about a lot, is just the comparison factor with social media and how that affects body image. Um, and so I think that's a big issue. But I hate to pull up technology because I feel like that's low hanging fruit and everybody talks about it, but it really um, interferes so much with the amount of movement and social interaction that people get these days. Yeah. And, you know, I think people point to it because it certainly is part of our, our challenge and in, in figuring out how we live well with it because it's not going away. And so, um, you know, I, I think it's, it's certainly right to talk about it because it's there and, and figuring out what problems it, it poses and and potentially how we can use it harness it for good too i agree even tiktok which is all the rage right now has <laughs> so much positive there's some therapists on there that are phenomenal there are ex people that have exercise platforms that you might not know about mm -hmm. and um and even the dances that kids do provides movement but the key is balance and and i don't know if you've watched uh the netflix documentary gosh what is the name of it but Oh, I haven't it watched it yet. Yeah, I know what you're talking about, but I haven't watched it yet. Um, but it, it talks about how we're it, the marketing and how we they, they intentionally try to get us to watch more and more and more. And so it's it's designed so that we crave it and need more and more. So when the balance is off, it's not a good thing. So you shared with me an email that um, thinking about that balance that you often use exercise or movement as part of your practice and part of a, a treatment plan for your patients. Could you talk about the role of exercise in that capacity? Yes. Actually, there's some standard questions I ask every single session, which is talk to me about your sleep, nutrition, exercise, sunlight, and um, or exposure to sunlight and screen use. Huh. And so we always look at those. Uh, because it's really important, and I want that to be ingrained in these kids as they get older. Is if my mood is off, I need to look at my balance with these things. Also, as you, uh, how old are your children? Actually? They're five and eight. Okay, and Both as you boys. know, even at five, it, oh, oh, are they? Oh, how fun! Mm -hmm. But even it's probably especially your eight-year-old. An outsider can influence more sometimes than even a parent. Mm -hmm. So, if my clients are hearing this from me, which they're typically hearing from their parents too, it might increase the likelihood. So I really try to get my clients to get some exercise at least five days a week. And so um, sometimes we'll use a habit tracker to, to mark how much they're doing. Sometimes we'll set monthly intentions. We'll, I'll work with them on finding exercise partners or, or other people to work out with. But we talk about it on a daily basis. In fact, the session I just had before you, um, this kid's a little bit depressed and, and is not getting the movement that he got with school. And we talked about how to increase that. So it's, so that's what I do. Yeah. And, uh, what challenges do you find in trying to encourage kids to, to move more or to choose any of these healthy behaviors? The challenge is they just don't do it. Some of them, right. I would say probably half just don't do it. Mm -hmm. Um, and sometimes there's, parental support or modeling, which that helps. Sometimes the parents just aren't in the habit of exercising. And, and so they don't push it as hard. Um, I do see, find that with my clients with social anxiety, they tend to avoid it more because they don't want to be seen out going for a walk. So then we use that, right? And we talk about applying some of the social anxiety treatment to it. Um, and then I'll have clients that are so depressed that extra, getting up and putting on your workout shoes or, or starting of an exercise video just feels more that they that they can handle. Yeah. Um, the other piece is some youth tend to be thinner. I know we see more 
uh, childhood obesity, but it's easier to keep your weight down for some people when you're younger than as you age. Mm -hmm. And so they don't have, I mean, that can be a motivator for people, right, is wanting to keep a healthy weight. So those are some of the challenges I find. Um, the other thing is we've created a culture, and I just honestly don't know if this is more typical to our some states or if this is in all of the U.S., and maybe you can speak to this, but we've created a culture where at a certain age, youth exercise is revol revolves around sports. And that's great if you play a sport, but if you don't play a sport, I see that group of kids not getting exercise at all. Yeah, I think we're, you know, I, I mentioned earlier before we were recording that we're doing some focus groups and, and it's to really learn about you, the needs of health related needs of youth in our community. And one of the things we're, we're learning is that kind of in that middle school age group, that's exactly what you just described is that some of the opportunities for sport fall off and um, we see activity fall off at that same time period. And, and I don't think that's a here thing. It might be worse in Kentucky than it is other places. Um, but I don't think that that's a, a challenge that's unique to Kentucky. Mm -hmm. Really interesting observation. Yeah. It, and yeah. And if they, if the family's not hiking and kayaking and going for bike rides, mm -hmm. if the family's not naturally doing it, and then the child has some social anxiety or some body image issues, then they tend to just stay in during the high school years. So. Yeah. So what do you find most rewarding? And then on the flip side, most frustrating about your career? You know, I have a lot of friends saying, my gosh, how do you do it? Like, how do you not take this home? Or how is it not being a therapist not so heavy? And, and my response is always that I get to see people get better, which mm -hmm. is really mm -hmm. wonderful. Is I get to see families get better and I get to see kids. And it, does it happen as fast as I want? Not always. Does it happen with every single family? Not always. And I'm, and I'm quick to say, hey, you guys, if, if, my stuff, if my approach isn't working, let's find somebody that does. But it is so rewarding to see kids and families get better. That, yeah. that sounds I, like I it might, ask what's the yeah. what's most frustrating, yeah. but I think you covered that in the question as well, you know, that it maybe doesn't happen on your timeline or um, not yeah. everyone gets better, but at the end of the day, the good kind of seems like it outweighs the, the bad. Absolutely. And my frustration probably is when I can't get people in as frequently as I want. If I have, mm -hmm. I have, don't have that balance with the number of patients versus slots. That's probably my biggest stressor professionally is trying to keep a balance for myself so that I'm not working all the time, but making sure that people can be seen as frequently as they need. Yeah. So outside of your career, you have been uh, heavily involved in our community and in many organizations that focus on, on youth, like Girls on the Run, Camp Horse and Around, and others. So what motivates you to give back to our community, in particular to the youth in our community? You know, I was really lucky. I grew up in a small town, Franklin, Kentucky, near Bowling Green, and my parents served on boards. They volunteered. They were community leaders. So they modeled, they just modeled giving back. And it was, I was never told that I was expected to, but that's just kind of what they did. So after I, my, I had, I had toddlers and I realized I'm really just focusing it on our family. And I realized it's time. I've, I've got, finished my degree. I've gotten the kids were in our house. Um, and so when life, when I was at that spot, I decided I wanted to start getting involved. And it made sense to me to work with youth because um, that's just what I know well. And I decided to get involved, like I helped with Bernie Madigan Duke and we helped start Girls on the Run here in Lexington. Um, so I've just always been drawn to that um, as a, because it's a, it's a knowledge base that I have. So but I think it's really important I, and I also feel this responsibility to give back because um, I am very fortunate that I have been able, I had the ability and the resources to get a PhD. Um, and the, this community be, community has been so supportive of my, of my practice that I also feel that obligation to give back. I try to speak for free at any PTA that asks me to or do any TV interview, like anything I can do I, with during COVID, I've done a lot of um, I have done a lot of PTA virtual meetings for parents on how to handle, help their kids through COVID or just kind of uh, been interviewed to talk about mental health and COVID. So when any chance I can get, I like to, because once again, this community has been so supportive. Well, it's a, it's a good lesson in just kind of 
being being grateful and thoughtful about how you use your your time and your talents in the world. So I you know I know that that our community appreciates that for sure. Well, thank you. So one of and I get bored easy, honestly. I <laughs> there get you bored. go, keeping and yourself so busy. <laughs> it does. Yeah, I need some novelty in my life, and so I could like play tennis or golf, or and then all day. You know, I could like have a passion, but those are so time consuming. <laughs> so for me, just throwing it into nonprofit work seems to fit my needs and skills. Yeah, so that's a nice segue. You mentioned some some active sports, um, and one of our goals with the Active Women's Health Initiative is to encourage women to be active. And I know that um, you lead an active lifestyle yourself, and kind of model some of the things that you are are teaching your your families and the youth. So, what motivates you to be active? You know, one is that I just don't feel good unless I exercise. Like my body craves it. I crave cardio. So I'm fortunate. I say that often. Is I love exercise when I'm planning out my day or my weekends or even our travel it's I just get a bang for it and I know that's not from it but I know that's not true for all of my clients and my friends but the other piece is I do actually have a lot of friends that like to move and so my husband and I have a tandem bicycle and we have this cool group of friends that we tandem with and we go to tandem rallies I have my closest group of one of my closest group of girlfriends we get away two or three times a year and we always go somewhere and hiking is the focus of it mm -hmm. so part of the motivation is my body needs it and the other is it's so ingrained into my social life like my running partner knows more about me sometimes than than other people yeah. um and so it's a good friendship so and then if I, the clothes start to feel a little tight, I honestly hate that feeling. Mm -hmm. And so that's a big motivator too, is I just want to feel comfortable in my body and I feel more comfortable uh, when I've been working out. So what are some of your biggest challenges then in, in maintaining an active lifestyle? My, my biggest challenge is that I am kind of a night owl. So I don't work out in the mornings. It's just, I've tried over the years, but it's, it's just not what I do. Um, and so if I'm serving on too many boards or have been too many evening commitments, then I can't get the exercise in. Mm -hmm. So COVID has actually been really, really nice because I've worked out more during COVID than I, um, than ever because I have more free time and, and I'm lucky because my kids are out of the house. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I'm not taking care of little ones like you during this crazy time, but it, so it's making sure that I keep enough time in the evening, um, uh, free time in the evenings to work out. Yeah, that time factor. I mean, whether you're a, a morning person or a night owl, it's, you know, there's always carving that time out is there's always something that can get in the way for sure. So in an email, when we were going back and forth, um, I, I want to share something you said, because I thought it was, it, it's a really interesting um, perspective. And you said, quote, I exercise regularly, but excel in no sport and feel no shame for that. And, oh. <laughs> um, and, and I just thought it's, it's a perspective of someone who has, is, has a, has an active lifestyle and, um, you know, is, is maybe not a sports person. I'm kind of reading through the, in between the lines there, but I'm just wondering if you could talk about that perspective and why that's important to you. You know, I'm smiling. I'm, I'm, I wish that's the negative with podcasts is you can't see that because it, yeah. <laughs> it is so true. So I started running in high school and ran and ran over until now my hips and knees aren't so happy. And mm -hmm. I'm not willing to do all the core work that it would take to be able to run without pain. But I, um, when I was a runner, especially, I ran a 10 minute mile, sometimes maybe a nine and a half. And so when you're running, you can really compare that to people. And I had, I struggled a little bit with, am I really a runner if I'm just running a 10 minute mile? And then, so that, that was part of it. And I, and I did a lot of work myself and, and realized that doesn't matter. I don't have to excel at it, but I get to participate in the culture of it. I get to enjoy the bourbon chase with a group of people in a van or train for the tap marathon with friends. Um, even cycling, I have a husband, my husband cycles and he's really, really fast. Uh, and he always rides with the A group and I not fast and I have no, and I have, a, I know I don't I really have a desire to be super fast, except on the back of the tandem. It's easy to be fast. Yes. Um, cause he's leading. So yeah, he's leading. I, You're good. <laughs> I just accepted that I'm going to move and be active, but I don't need to be, I don't need to kill it 
Um, yeah. But it, it did take me a few years. It, probably in my 30s, I felt less secure. Now in my 50s, I'm mm-hmm. just happy that I'm still exercising and moving and all that stuff. Yeah. And I just think it's such an important perspective to share with people because I, there's certainly a perception out there that, you know, people think, oh, I'm not an athlete or I'm not a this or that, or, you know, and it, I think it's okay to just be who you are and to enjoy moving um, regardless of how fast or um, whether you're on the podium or not. And so I just wanted to share that with the audience. Yeah. So thinking back to um, us parents or adults or care providers, um, what do you, what what do you wish advice what advice do you wish you could give to adults who interact with young people the biggest way they can help is to model exercise not to preach exercise but to model that that activity so whether you're a grandparent or you're a parent and you're traveling with your kids walk that mile to the museum when you're in chicago instead of taking a taxi um, on the weekend say, Hey, do you guys want to hike or do you want to bike? So model that physical activity, because that's the biggest influence you can have, um, on youth. And then if you do find that kids are interested in some type of sport or movement, facilitate it, carve out family time and money so that you can make it happen. Uh, but I go back to my, my clients who aren't playing a sport in high school, who have parents that are active, their kids are still active because it's just been built in from childhood that we, that, that, that families, like I said, hike or kayak or climb, or they just move a lot. Mm -hmm. Is there any other thoughts you have on, on youth and activity or health in general that you'd like to share? Um, I do. One thing that, that has come up in my practice a few times this week, because it's crunch time academically for kids and they don't think they have time to work out. Um, is I remind them that you think you're too busy now, but one day you'll have a career and a mortgage and children. And it's more of a mindset of carving it out until instead of waiting until there's time. And so even though kids have so much on their plate right now, uh, especially college kids, because the semester, well, you know that the semester was cut short and they had to cram so much in, is even when you think you don't have time, make that time. I, I think that's a good lesson for, for all of us. Is there anything else you'd like to share with our audience today? I think that's it. You had such a great, great set of questions. Well, thank you for taking your time with us today. We uh, know that you're busy and that uh, you have lots of, of people to see. So we appreciate you spending some minutes here with us today. Absolutely. Well, thank you for having me. Thank you for listening to the Champions of Active Women podcast. This podcast is brought to you by the Active Women's Health Initiative, and was produced by the Faculty Media Depot at the University of Kentucky. If you enjoyed this episode, you can listen and subscribe to all of our episodes wherever you find your podcasts. For up-to-date information about the Active Women's Health Initiative, you can find us on social media at UKAWHI. Thank you for supporting us as we work to promote health and physical activity among girls and women across the lifespan. 